so I will introduce myself. So, my name is Hélène Langevin. I'm, I'm the director of the Osher Center for Integrated Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. And uh, I am going to have the pleasure today of sort of turning, oh, can we have the overview slide? I'm sorry, back. Just, yeah. We're gonna be, I'm gonna be kind of turning the pivot now. I'm gonna just, uh, we, we had just this beautiful, I think this morning, illustration of uh, integrative medicine uh, practice, philosophy, research, uh, and we uh, now are going to start looking at more like bio the biology of fascia, the biology of cancer, and we're going to talk about some processes that really influence, and this is going to be what I'm going to be focusing on, uh, inflammation and fibrosis that are pathological processes that have great relevance. We've already heard some of that. Some of uh, the speakers this morning already mentioned uh, inflammation and fibrosis in relationship to fatigue and lymphedema. And, uh, and so the, you're, hopefully you're going to see how, how all of this is, is coming together. So I can have now my, my slides, please. So I'm going to talk about fascia, acupuncture, and manual therapy. And first of all, I don't have anything to disclose. So first question, what do acupuncture and manual therapy have in common? It's not immediately obvious. And, and my own research in interests in uh, fascia and connective tissue came out of my background in acupuncture research, and this was really a very, almost like a chance finding that some years ago, uh, the, the sort of the observation that acupuncture needles actually interact with connective tissue in a very interesting way. The acupuncture needle, we like to think of them almost like as little probes that you can insert into the body, and when you manipulate the, pro the, the needle, either via rotation or up and down motion, the connective tissue binds to the needle, and you don't have to do, this is an exaggerated version here where if you twist the needle quite a lot, you can eventually pull the skull skin up, but you don't have to do it quite that much. Even if you just do very, very small manipulations of the needle, the connective tissue essentially kind of binds to the needle, and if you twist the needle just a little bit, it goes with the needle. So the acupuncture needle is a way to mechanically stimulate the tissue. So it's an interesting thing. So the needle is essentially stretching the tissue from the inside as the tissue is kind of following the needle around as the needle is moving. And of course, manual therapy this is a little bit of an extreme example, but uh, man most ma forms of manual therapy apply a combination of pressure and also sort of shear uh, 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 forces to the, the tissues, the for the surface of the skin, but most manual therapists, I mean, kind of believe that what they're doing is not, of course, just on the surface. They're really working on the deeper tissues, and of course, a lot of those deeper tissues are uh, what we call soft tissues, including muscles and connective tissues. So what is connective tissue? So connective tissue is a fascinating thing. Uh, I became really, really interested in it, uh, and now uh, most of the lab is really focused on research on, on connective tissue uh, and, uh, and, and, and the pathology that, that we may be associated with connective tissue that we don't know a whole lot about, because connective tissue has not been uh, the source of a whole lot of attention, I think, in, especially in the whole medical field. Uh, if you open a textbook of rheumatology or orthopedics, you're, you're, um, which are the fields that should be concerned with the musculoskeletal system, after all, connective tissue is part of the musculoskeletal system, you're lucky if you find a paragraph on uh, connective tissue itself, which is very strange. Um, most of these uh, disciplines are concerned with uh, joints, uh, bones, muscles, but the fascia, the, the loose, the non-specific loose and dense connective tissue planes that kind of envelop everything, that go around everything, that connects everything with everything else. Uh, those things are not really very much uh, studied in either rheumatology or in orthopedics. But so that's the 
the important thing about this connective tissue is really it both uh, it, it, it surrounds all the muscles, but it also allows for some play because there's loose connective tissue that separates the fascial planes. The fascial planes we tend to think of them as the layers of denser, tougher, you know, uh, of fascia that actually can bear some load. But in between those layers of fascia, there's some loose kind of gliding layers that allow these fascial layers to, to slide and, 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 and have some range of motion. But um, so that's the musculoskeletal kind of function of, of this, and I could talk about this for a long time, but there's another important aspect, though, of connective tissue, and that's because it, that it's, that's essentially its immune function. Connective tissue essentially houses the, what we call the extracellular fluid, right? The, the, everything, all the uh, sort of uh, connective tissue matrix is where fluid exchanges take place between uh, the blood and the lymphatics. And uh, a lot of, of immune responses, such as inflammation, happen in connective tissue. So I call it, you know, it's both the, the, the container for immune exchanges and also the conduit through which water, protein, molecules, et cetera. And of course, this is what goes terribly wrong in lymphedema, is what we heard about this morning. So another thing that's very important about connective tissue is it's, it, it's a critical uh, component. This is where wound healing happens, right? Wounds cannot heal without some very important things happening in connective tissue. So this is a, the, what we call the wound healing sort of triad that, that I lifted from uh, one of uh, Edna Kuchermann's uh, recent articles. Uh, and, uh, and this is kind of illustrated here where there's a lot of things that need to happen uh, with uh, starting with coagulation virus is when there's a wound that needs to heal. Imagine a gaping wound, it's bleeding, something has to first of all stop the blood. And then the inflammation, inflammation is the first thing that happens, the, the cardinal signs of inflammation, right? Redness, swelling, pain. And then the, the, the neutrophils pile in, and then you've got acute, acute inflammation, and then the cell proliferation, and finally this inflammation has to, this, the wound has to heal. So the fibroblasts are gonna come in, and then they're gonna make a scar, and they're gonna essentially close the wound. And then there's this very interesting phenomenon of myofibroblasts, which essentially become these contractile fibroblasts that essentially pull the wound together. If you're a lion out there in the jungle and you don't have stitches to close your wound, you're going to die unless your wound can actually, you know, stop bleeding and finally close shut and not stay sort of gaping and reopening all the time. But the important thing is that as this whole process, which is life-saving, right, uh, is also needs to stop. If it keeps going forever, it's not going to be helpful. It needs to eventually have an end. And this is what we call resolution, right? And, and this is when the wound essentially stops kind of healing itself and essentially becomes a, a scar. And then the person can go on with their life. The inflammation has no more usefulness, right? But what happens when this process does not resolve. And we're starting to now understand, to understand that when wounds do not continue to stay inflamed and that this process of wounds, wound resolution does not occur, that's not a good thing. And uh, what you can start seeing is, first of all, some evidence that the inflammation is not going away. You can have some fibrosis that starts to develop in the tissues. As a result, it's almost, think of this as ongoing scarring. It's not like a scar that happens and then it stops and it becomes this inert scar. You have this ongoing process of sort of scarification. And then, as we will hear a lot more, more this afternoon, this fibrotic process is really, now we start understanding that th this can also contribute and feed into the propensity of, uh, ca for cancer to happen. So this is a, a serious thing, right? And so um, clearly the role of connective tissue in all of these processes is very important. So let's go back to the musculoskeletal some, for, uh, system for a, se a second and go back to the role of connective tissue in body movements, in stretching, in manual therapy, and acupuncture. What happens when both body movements and externally applied forces uh, impact the connective tissue? What happens to this tissue? Well, um, this is kind of biomechanics 101, right? You have a force, and depending on how stiff 
this tissue is, some deformation is imparted on it. If you try to stretch an elastic that's very, very stiff, it's not going to deform very much. So you're going to have a low amount of strain, which is what we call the deformation, right? Strain is the what we call delta L over L0, how much this elastic is going to deform. If it's very stiff, it's not going to deform elastic, but it's going to have a lot of stress. Stress is the force divided by the cross-sectional area, okay? So you can have a very stiff tissue is going to have is, uh, the same amount of force will generate high stress and low strain. The reverse, if you have a tissue that's very loose, very uh, compliant, the same amount of force would generate a high strain, but a small amount of cross-sectional stress, okay? So you can see here that the stiffness of this tissue is going to have a lot to do with the, uh, the behavior of the tissue uh, in situ. So how does this Re re interrelate with this? That's the question, right? How do mechanical forces that are applied in daily life when we walk, when we jump around, when we exercise, when we stretch, when we do yoga, or when we have a, a massage, or when we have an acupuncture treatment, how do these forces interact with the connective tissue at its given level of stiffness, which is important, which is not the same everywhere in your body, and how does that impact the processes that are going on unbeknownst to everybody inside your body, such as, you know, some little bits of chronic inflammation, perhaps a little bit of fibrosis here and there that maybe may be manifesting as some perhaps some chronic pain somewhere. Um, we don't know because we can't see these things, right, underneath of the skin. But what if they were happening? When, they, when if there was some, that, some of that going on? How, do, how would these movements and these forces uh, interact with that? So the question we're asking is, could tissue forces generated during stretching of connective tissue influence inflammation, fibrosis, and eventually possibly cancer growth? So in my lab, we're really interested in this. And we, have, uh, we work with two different models of inflammation. One of them is what we call acute self-limiting inflammation, which is what I talked about. It's essentially a wound. We uh, essentially make a very, very tiny little incision, and this is a, just to orient you a piece of rat uh, 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 skin, uh, subcutaneous tissue, and muscle over the, the back. And you see these little blue lines are the two layers of fascia in the back, and we just essentially cut the connections between the two layers, and then we wait uh, uh, two weeks, and then these uh, we heal in the form of a, a, an adhesion. That's essentially an internal scar. The two layers are stuck together. And what you see here is that this, the inflammation associated with this injury eventually goes away. This is self-limiting, but the animal is, goes back to a kind of normal, but has lost some freedom of motion in this particular area, right? That's the consequence of a scar. But you can see that the process of this uh, inflammation has essentially resolved. And so um, there's this inflammatory uh, acute inflammation followed by this kind of chronic resolution phase. And we know that in order for this, uh, this um, inflammation to resolve, there needs to be a, a particular program of resolution that gets to be activated. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later. Now, the other model that uh, we look at is a model of chronic inflammation, where in instead of in an injury, a mechanical injury, we, you inject a substance called carrageenan. This is actually stuff that's in like the yogurt that you eat, which is a scary thing. And what this does is it, is it induces, uh, first of all, at the beginning, acute inflammation. This is a neutrophil infiltration. This is the same kind of section, but you see this is a, you see the purple here is the neutrophils. Then about two weeks later, this inflammation now has become chronic. These are now macrophages. So you can see two weeks later, instead of having healed with a scar, you still have some ongoing chronic inflammation here. Six weeks later, you see that the inflammation is starting to organize. There's still a little bit, you can't see that too well now, but I can tell you there's a little bit of macrophage still left in this lesion. It's not completely gone. And even at 10 weeks, it's mostly scarred up. You see mostly fibrous tissue, but there's still some lingering inflammation. So this is chronic inflammation. It's pretty, pretty uh, classic. And what you see here, you have acute inflammation with the neutrophils in the first two days, but then you can see that this macrophage population increases and continues and persists. M1 macrophages here are the macrophages that are the inflammatory macrophages. M2 
are the what we call the pro-resolving macrophages that are there to sort of clean up the debris and, and clean up the mess. You can see that in the acute model, the M1 macrophages go back down and the acute and M2 macrophages take over, whereas here, uh, the M2 macrophages don't seem to be quite able to take over and the M1 macrophages are still there, okay? So these are the models. So the first model we looked at and we asked the question, could some stretching, okay, of the connective tissue planes of the back, so what we do is we take the mouse and we sus partially suspend the mouse by the tail, and the mouse kind of grabs on, this is what mice do spontaneously when you do this, they hold on to the, to the whatever the edge of the table that you do, and then they shoot their feet back, and they do this spontaneously, and they just essentially stretch. And the, the important thing to realize here is the tissues that are being stretched during this procedure are the connective tissues of the back over the latissimus dorsi, which is essentially this huge sheet called the thoracolumbar fascia that connects the shoulders to the hips. So when people sometimes tell me, well, the back, the mouse is arching its back, so it's not stretching. It is stretching. Try putting your arms up for a second. Just try. Feel what's going on in your back. Is your back, is your, do you feel your connective tissues of your back being stretched? Yes, right? That's what's going on in this mouse. So I've convinced you, hopefully. So this mouse, this mouse is stretching its back. This mouse is simply out of the cage for 10 minutes, and, and so we stretch for 10 minutes, okay? The mice are actually able to tolerate this for 10 minutes, which is quite surprising. And so this is the injury method, and what we looked at pro-collagen 1, which is the newly formed collagen, the amount of collagen that is formed after an injury. And you can see that the non-stretched animal, you have a big increase in pro-collagen 1, but the stretched animal, you have less so. There's no longer a statistically significant difference between the stretched, uh, the injured and the non-injured. So this has kind of knocked down the amount of collagen. So is this a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I don't know. I guess, you know, if the mouse had had enough healing and did not need to make more collagen, perhaps it is a good thing. But we still didn't quite know how to interpret this. So then we said, okay, let's try the inflammation model. So we injected the carrageenan into the animal. We, this is a rat this time. We stretched them the same way, 10 minutes, twice a day. And then we looked at a couple of things. We wanted to know, is the animal better as a result of this, right? So we first looked at how the animal was walking because when you inject carrageenan into the back, they don't quite walk right. Their, their stride length is a little bit decreased. So we saw that with the stretched animals, they were walking better, the stride, stride length was uh, improved. We did von Frey testing on them, which is the pain sensitivity, so a higher score uh, is, is uh, bad. So you see that their pain sensitivity decreased, which is good. Uh, they were less sensitive to being poked in the back. And then we looked at the macrophages. Now, we did not separate between these M1 and M2. We just used a pan macrophage uh, stain, and we quantified the amount of whole macrophages in the skin and, and the lesion, and it was decreased with the stretch quite markedly. So there was some indication that the, that the stretching was decreasing this chronic inflammation. So we were curious, though, because when you're stretching something uh, using this method, there's a lot of things that are going on. It's not just stretching the connective tissue. The rat is actually activating some muscles. It's probably under some amount of stress because, you know, it's being hold, held by the tail. It's not doing this under its own volition. So um, we, we were wondering, perhaps it's getting kind of a nice outpouring of glucocorticoids throughout its whole system, which, you know, that's a pretty good anti-inflammatory agent, right, on an acute basis. So we thought, well, perhaps that's what's going on. So we compared active stretching to passive stretching, where we anesthetized the animal. We essentially uh, extended the difference between the shoulders and the hip approximately by the same distance that the rat does spontaneously, which is, turns out to be about 25% of the distance. And then we compared that to anesthesia alone under the same conditions, but without the stretching. And we found that the active stretching was a little bit better than the passive stretching, but not significantly, statistically significantly so. Both of these were better than the anesthesia only, okay? So what that suggests is that whatever going on with the passive stretching in terms of simply, this was not a difference in stress, right? Because these two rats are equally stressed and it's not muscle contraction. So what's left, right? It's just a stretching of this tissue. So then we thought, well, okay, let's look now in the acute phase of inflammation because what I've told you before 
is that this program of inflammation resolution that we're talking about, what turns off the inflammation, actually starts really, really early. We know that this supposed, this, this, and I'm going to tell you more about the mechanism of that later, but it starts in the first 24 to 48 hours of inflammation is when the inflammation is already getting ready to stop itself. So we thought, okay, let's look at what happens about the stretching in the acute phase of inflammation. So 48 hours after the same carrageenan effect. So remember, this is now pouring out. The neutrophils are still there. You don't have macrophages yet. And we looked at the thickness of, of the inflammatory region, and already at 48 hours, this rat's only been stretched uh, four times. And there's a decrease in the inflammatory lesion thickness, and we measured this with ultrasound decrease in the cross-sectional area here that's significant. We looked at the inflammatory lesion and we counted the total number of inflammatory cells and that was significantly decreased by quite a bit. And then we did flow cytometry so we specifically looked at the, uh, the neutrophil uh, count and that was also significantly quite a big difference. So um, we then wondered, well, okay, what's causing this decrease in, 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 in inflammation? Is there already a pathway that's being activated? And this is uh, a slide from Dr. Charles Sirhan's uh, uh, lab at the Brigham that we're collaborating with, who has, they essentially d discovered these molecules that are called resolvins and uh, protectins, marisins. These are mo molecules that are derivatives of omega-3 fatty acids that you uh, take in your diet, okay? And this is complicated, but I'll walk you through this, so don't worry about this yet. So um, what essentially these are called specialized pro-resolving mediator molecules, and these are, these are eicosanoids, okay? They're derived from these fatty acids. They're part of the cell membrane, but they get released at the beginning of inflammation, and their job, so this is inflammation, right? acute inflammation. And then the job of these molecules, these are called SPMs, resolvents, protecting marism, is essentially to turn the green light on this whole pro-resolution pathway. And what this pro-resolution pathway does is it switches the eicosanoids from the pro-inflammatory, so the, 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 the leukotrienes, for example, to the anti or pro-resolution uh, molecules, such as like the lipoxins. And then they switch the macrophages from the M1 to the M2. And so they promote these resolving macrophages and eventually the resolution of the inflammation. If you don't have, if you block these molecules, then you, it, if you do not have this resolution, then the inflammation becomes chronic and the, and the, 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 the inflammation does not resolve. So this type of pathway has been uh, now very well described and uh, it has been shown to really be uh, relevant in a variety of uh, disease, uh, inflammatory diseases throughout the body. So we wondered, is it possible that our stretching is affecting these inflammation resolution pathways? So the first thing we did, if you look at this upper left uh, corner graph here, is we wondered what if it's instead of stretching, you injected this resolvent, which we, we chose resolving D2 for this particular one. Uh, you just injected resolvent into the lesion at the same time as the carrageenan, but you didn't stretch the animal. And then we compared that to stretching. And the two had very similar effects. Uh, the, 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 there was no statistically significant difference between the, resol the resolving injection and the stretching, and both were better than the no stretch. Uh, we then thought, okay, let's see if the tissues are making their own resolving in response to the stretching. So we measured the amount of resolving. This time we picked resolving D1 because there was a commercially available ELISA assay for it. Uh, but, uh, but D1 and D2 are very uh, equivalent. And uh, so we looked at the amount of resolving D1 in the lesion and found that it was increased uh, by the stretching. We then looked at some inflammatory mediators. We picked leukotrienes for this. We did not see a significant difference, but we were curious to see whether there would be an increase in leukotrienes because, but we didn't. In fact, we saw a trend towards a decrease. And that's interesting because you could say, well, maybe what you're doing when you're stretching is just injuring the animal more. And maybe that's why it's making resolvins, it's because you're adding inflammation to the system, and that's why it's making resolvins. But no, because in, if that were the case, you would have seen an increase in leukotrienes, not a decrease. And if you look at the ratio of resolvins to leukotrienes, it's, it's much, much greater. 
uh, in the stretch than the known stretch. So it looks like the ratio of resolvin to inflammatory, inflammatory uh, uh, molecules has really kind of shifted. So, okay, all of this is happening in an animal. And so, you know, you could argue that, well, maybe it was, it was not really going on in the, uh, nothing to do with the connective tissue. Maybe you had sort of vascular changes around the lesion or lymphatic changes or whatever. We were really interested in knowing what's happening in the connective tissue itself. So we decided, okay, let's try to do all of this outside of an animal. So we took the piece of connective tissue and we dissected it. And then we, we devised a, a little, little hole in the center, a little well. And put, uh, and put the neutrophils, it extracted, uh, purified from the same rat, and we put the neutrophils on top of the tissue. And then we put a substance underneath of the tissue, like a chemoattractant, something called FMLP, which actually pulls, it's, it's something that calls the neutrophils. And so the neutrophils had to essentially travel through the connective tissue and get to the other side. So that's kind of what we've illustrated here. So there's our, there's our little section here. There's our tissue, the grips on either side, the, the neutrophils are on top, and then the buffer. And then we count how many neutrophils have actually crossed the connective tissue and made it over to the other side. So here um, we, we've looked at, uh, so this is without stretching, you have this amount of, of neutrophils. And then with stretching, you have a significant decrease in the amount of neutrophils that are making to the side. So it could be that the neutrophils are actually, uh, the migration has been uh, decreased or they got somehow trapped in the tissue or something. But in any case, this decreased the chemotaxis of the neutrophils to the, uh, the attractant. We then wondered uh, whether uh, this particular, a similar setup, this time with no well, but just the connective tissue itself being pulled, would produce its own resolvins, and it did. So you had an increase in resolvins in the stretch tissue compared with the non-stretch. But remember, this is all outside of an animal. Okay, so we can see, we can see similar things that we saw: less neutrophils uh, going across and more resolvins being produced. So what we're wondering now is, you know, what's going on? What's making the resolvent? So here's our model. Here we got the neutrophils on top, and normally the neutrophils are crossing, and then the neutrophils are making their own sort of uh, uh, inflammatory agents that are maybe calling more neutrophils. But in the stretching, something is decreasing that. Is it because the, uh, the connective tissue itself is making the resolvents that are then blocking the neutrophils, which are then making less? Uh, inflammatory molecules, which is then, you know, furthering this, this, this kind of system uh, and, and decreasing the amount of, of essentially neutrophil migration. So this is kind of where we are right now in our hypothesis. So I want to just show you another experiment, which is kind of important here for specifically for this conference because it has to do with fibrosis. Remember I talked about, say, what happens to chronic inflammation? When inflammation becomes chronic, then you get, you get a fibrotic response. We wanted to know, with the same stretching, decrease fibrosis in a disease model that has fibrosis in it. So we picked a scleroderma, which is a, uh, a, a disease of, of the connective tissue that causes a very severe uh, fibrosis of the skin and the underlying connective tissues. And uh, it's, we, there is an animal model of this, which is a graft versus host disease. When patients who get bone marrow transplants, for example, get, um, they, 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 they get this graft versus host response, and it's a phenotype that's very, very similar to scleroderma. They get a very similar uh, increased tightness and, and stiffening of, of the, the, the arms and, and fingers and face. And, and so uh, we, there is an animal model of a graft versus host where you inject splenocytes, either allogeneic or syngeneic, and that determines whether the, uh, the splenocytes are going to reject the animal or not. So the ones that are the scleroderma animals here uh, are compared with the controls. And we, in each group, we had a stretch group and a non-stretch group. So just to orient you to here, so the scleroderma group, which has the, have the disease, is in blue and red, and the control group is in uh, black and green. So let's just look at the sclerodermal. You can see that that does not, and our outcome, so these, these animals are going to be injected with the uh, splenocytes, and then they're going to be stretched every day uh, for I can't, three weeks. And at the end, we, uh, we did ultrasound on the skin to, to measure the thickness of the skin. And this is, we measured this, this skin zone here using a high-frequency ultrasound. 
And so we were wanted to know is does the stretch animal skin, because the, the skin becomes thicker when it's inflamed, and does it decrease uh, in, in response to the stretching? So blue is the scleroderma animal that's non-stretched, and red is the scleroderma animal that is stretched. And you see that there at the, at the week point three, there's a significant difference between the stretched and the non-stretch. And uh, the, um, I'm sorry, I didn't put the p-value there, but I was point, point 0.01, I think. And, um, and then you can see that at week four, it all comes down. And the reason why it comes down at week four is because this, this, this uh, graft versus host eventually resolves itself. But there's still some remaining fibrosis, I think, in these tissues. And so our next step is to look at what's going on at week four and to see and to look at some fibrotic markers. And we, I don't have this data yet. But then what about cancer? And this is especially because there is now, of course, great interest because of the, th the thought that inflammation and fibrosis could be so important in cancer formation that there's really a lot of interest in these resolving uh, molecules and compounds. And there's these analogs of, res of, of these SMPs. Uh, this particular analog is BML. It's, a, it's an, an analog of lipoxin, which is in the same family as the resolvent in cancer models. So this particular one is, is a cancer model with subcutaneous injection of, 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 this, of hepa hepatocarcinoma cells. And when they inject this resolvent analog, you can see that the cancer progression is, is much slowed down. So would it be possible, if, if our hypothesis is that stretching is activating these resolving molecules, could it also slow down the growth of cancer cells? So this is an experiment that I did a, uh, at the University of Vermont, actually. So we used the same stretching, but instead we injected, uh, instead of the carrageenan, we injected uh, mesothelioma cells. And the reason why, why mesothelioma is because there was a lab next door who had mesothelioma cells growing in their, in their dish. And so we decided they actually were injecting the meso The mesothelioma normally does not grow subcutaneously. Obviously, it grows in the pleura. Right? But if you inject, these are very, very malignant cells, and if you inject them in a subcutaneous uh, tissue, they will grow locally, and uh, most, the, in a rare instance, they will metastasize, but most of these tumors will stay local, but they grow very, very fast. So it's a, it's a good model if you want to study uh, um, stretching. We wanted to stretch these animals over the course of a month, and over the course of a month, we wanted to make sure that there were some tumors that developed fast enough so that we could measure them, right? So what we did is we stretched a group of mice, and we compared stretch and no stretch, and it was a little bit surprising what we saw. So here, we saw that on average, uh, the, the stretched and uh, uh, was they were lower than the non-stretched, but uh, by not too much, but it was still significant. But these red dots up here represented the uh, the animals where the tumor became uh, metastatic to the uh, peritoneal cavity, and you can see that there's four of them in the stretch group and one of them in a non-stretch group. Now that's not statistically significant. It could just just be due to chance, but it made us wonder what was going on. If you assume, if you just think, okay, let's just look at those. And those uh, it's possible that once the the the, the, the the, uh, this tumor becomes metastatic, it, it behaves very differently, possibly. So if you remove these animals, now you have a, a pretty robust difference between stretch and no stretch. But what about these animals that had the metastases? That's worrisome. And I think that this is where, you know, we, we have not yet published these data, and we really want to uh, test this in a different model uh, before we can draw any conclusions from this. But so right now we're in the process of doing that and we're using a, a uh, actually a mammary cancer uh, model in mice. So we, uh, I don't have these results. Uh, we we're just starting to do that. But I think that uh, it's still, we're going to talk, we're going to hear some this afternoon about the safety of, of, of manual therapies and yoga and exercise and things like that in cancer. And I think it's worth thinking about. I mean, we have to wonder, and I know that some people have been concerned about you shouldn't do, for example, massage, you know, close to a tumor because you could induce, you know, spreading of cancer cells. But what if stretching was actually helpful? You know, we should know about that, right? It could be helpful, it could be not, but we need to know. And I think that whatever is going on here, we need to understand what's happening.
So I want to acknowledge, first of all, uh, my, my lab at uh, the University of Vermont, which is where a lot of the earlier studies were done, and uh, the current lab here at the Brigham and Women's, as well as the lab of uh, Dr. Charles Sirhan and Dr. Tony Aliprantis, and, and uh, where the uh, uh, scleroderma, we're collaborating for the scleroderma studies. Thank you very much.